So, welcome everyone to the Learning Principles session. How are you all doing? Good? Had your lunch? Yeah. Yes? One <coughs> short. One short. Oh, can you share? I'll share. I'll share. I'll share. Share with Satish. Thank you. Um, good. So, everyone ready to go for the afternoon? You're not feeling sleepy after lunch? Maybe a little bit. <laughs> All right, so I'll have to keep you wide awake. So today's session is the <coughs> learning principle. It's the second principle in the booklet. I'm sure you've all read it thoroughly now, haven't you? Yeah, well, some of you swatted for the quiz last week, a couple of weeks ago, didn't you? No. Somebody must have, because someone won. <laughs> One team won. They did swap. Okay, so today's session is the um, learning principle, and it's going to be two hours. We'll have a little five-minute break in between. As usual, please, if you've got any questions, if you've got any examples to share or any comments to make, please do so. It's an interactive process for us all to learn from each other. It is the learning principle, after all. Yes? Um, and uh, we've got a couple of videos to watch in this session as well. So make it a little bit interesting. You won't have to listen to me the whole time. Um, so let's kick off. Uh, oh, before we start, come in. Just going to miss the beginning of the story, never mind. So before we start, I thought I'd tell you about this bird, and it used to live in a cage. And the cage was right, right next to the window. And the bird would look out of the window and it would see other birds flying around and it would wonder what it must be like to fly in the sky like that. And it would wonder where do they go, what's beyond the trees out there. <coughs> anyway, one day, it was a hot sunny day, and the owner was cleaning the cage. And while the owner was cleaning the cage, they left the door open and they went to get fresh water. And they'd also left the window open because it was a hot day. So there was this bird, and it could see its opportunity to get out there and see what the other birds see. And it was really tempted. And then it thought, but what will I eat? I've got all my food here, everything that I need. I've got fresh water. I've got a safe place to sleep at night. If I went out there, where would I find food? Where would I find water? Where would I sleep? What if the other birds don't like me? What would I do? What's beyond those trees? I don't know. It might be dangerous. And then I thought, but still, I'm really curious. What's out there? What must it be like to fly in the sky? And it was wondering. It had all these questions in its head. Do you want to know what happens next? Are you a little bit curious? Yeah. Oh, you might have to wait for the answer then. <laughs> So, let's look at the learning principle. So we've already covered the first one, responsibility principle, yes? And the next one is the learning principle. Now in the first session we looked at the vision of the company, yes, and we broke it down. We looked at the strengths, financial disciplines, leanness, agility and warmth, and really unpacked the meanings of those words to make the vision really come to life so that we can understand it better. And now we know that the principles are our code of conduct, if you like, in terms of how to make that vision come to life. So we're going to be looking at the learning principle today. And the learning principle is broken down into learning to learn and learning to be better. Now why do you think the learning principle is important? Why do you think it might be useful for us as an organisation? For the group. Yes. In what way? Like by learning new things, you grow as that person as well as the company. Yeah. So you'll be able to do new things. Yes. Absolutely. Good. Yeah. Improvement. Improvement, yes. In what way? Um, I guess improving in everyday situations. Yes. Like the company that faces and that wants roles or something. So yes. In that how we interact with each other, the impact that we have. Have on clients and Clients as well, customers, suppliers, etc. Good. Anything else? Efficiency. To improve efficiency, yes, learn to do things better. Yes. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. 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 Y
I mean, market knowledge or technical knowledge. Oh, absolutely. Because for some of us, someone like me, this whole industry is brand new, completely different industry. So there's a, a lot to learn. Yeah. Um, is it a new industry for you as well? Yes. So you know, for a lot of us, it's a brand new industry. There's a lot to learn about the industry as well as the ins and out of a company like this. You know, because um, we're not just based here. We've got manufacturing at Ricelip as well. And we've got the site in India, we've got Wei Mei, so there's a lot to learn across the different sites. Lots of different specialisms going on across different departments. So it's important for the business because it allows us as individuals to do our roles better. And of course it's important for the business in terms of making things more efficient and increasing profitability and cutting costs. So it is an important part of what we do. Right, let's look at learning to learn. We're going to start off with a video. Now, while we're watching this video, it's a six-minute video, there are some questions that I'd like you to keep in mind, and I want you to take some notes so that you can come back with your comments after the vision, after the video, we can discuss what we found. So what I want you to look at is what did they learn, how did they learn, and how do they continue learning? Make sure you answer those questions as you're watching the video. Take an international clientele that created business philosophy and world-class marketing. It all adds up to a fish market. I'm Antonio Naz and I'm at the Pike Lakes Fish Market in beautiful Seattle, Washington. This place began as a humble fish stand, but in 1986, it began a journey of transformation to becoming the world-class entertainment destination that it is today. So, how did it go from small and smelly to big and beautiful? Let's find out. Pike Place Fish is legendary for their customer service and great product. But in the mid-80s, this wasn't the case. They realized they had to change the way they engaged their customers and made a bold decision that put love back in the equation. To find out why they've grown 400% in the last 20 years and enjoy 10 million retail visitors annually, I'm about to spend a day in their shoes. What I'm going to do right now is help these guys out, but according to them, I can't wear what I'm wearing right now. So I got my overalls, I don't know what the official name of this is. I'm going to get some boots as well, so I can really become part of the team today and figure out what they do and how they do it so well. Which way is the front? Take on and body what you're doing. A little common sense doesn't hurt. Yes, you sell them. Let's go sell some fish. Pike Place started out like any other fish market, but it was their answer to a common question, how do we define success, that changed everything. So world famous, where did that concept come from? Um, actually, it came from the first crew meeting that we had with Jim Burkwist. He said uh, that we had to create a vision for our company. Jim Burquist is the founder of the consulting firm Biz Futures that worked with the fishmongers to redefine their vision. What determines who you are when you come to work is the future that you guys are generating. So we're brainstorming there. One young man said, Well, wow, how about becoming world famous? And I looked at him and said, I'm crazy. They're a fishmonger. He says, You know what? He says, We would be like martial artists. We would show up at 6 30, we get the show set up by 8 o'clock. It would be impeccable. Now, what do you ask about customers? What does what world famous look like with customers? We have a customer behind the counter, Stephanie from Philadelphia, who's going to attempt to I catch fish. He said, uh, I think world famous would be where we make it really safe for people. She's going to catch them. We make sure they catch them. She did for Stephanie. She did for Stephanie. Yeah. Yeah. So, what makes Pike Place Fish a cool running company? We relate to people as human beings rather than just customers. So what do you think about the interaction with the people that work here? Is that unique for you? Have you experienced something like that before? Why is it unique? Why is it important that they were smiling or getting you involved in the process? Because it makes you want to be here. It makes you want to buy someone's product if they make you feel welcome and warm and comfortable where you are. So it wasn't necessarily about the product, the type of fish you're bringing in is about the customer service experience. Right. And what are some of the things you did for customer service to improve that and make it a unique experience? Well, we showed them that we love them. How do you show a customer that you love them? 
because we're real with them. Because once you create a relationship with somebody, they're going to be your customer for life. I know she talked to him on the fishmongers. Pretty in depth. I mean, did you expect that? Oh, it was great. Yeah, it was, it was uh, you know, not just focused on giving the information to you, but also being entertaining, making sure you're having a good time. That's what uh, I expected when I came out here. John, how do you measure success? Well, number one in business is profit, right? You have to measure profit. But another thing for us is how many people we, we have walked away with small Talk to me about your employees and what it means to work here, but also what it takes to work here. What do you, what do you bring to the table? The commitment to, to make a difference for other human beings. And a commitment to be, be part of the world, world famous philosophy. It's just a way of being. Being it all world famous. You, you want to be world famous, you have to commit to being world famous and have to be world famous. Pike Place's unusual philosophy has definitely paid off. How are you going to do it from a sales standpoint? Since we started this philosophy, we've increased our sales dramatically every year. Every year, increasing sales. Every year. Okay, what can I get for you guys? King Crab Legs. How many would you like? And today, they're literally world famous. With a little help from the internet, Pike Place ships their fish all around the globe. Well, we ship anywhere in the U.S., but we have customers order from all over the world. And what percentage of your business comes from, like, going to London? Uh, I'd say probably about 15, 20 percent. Later that night, I got to sit in on a group dinner. Sacred tradition for Pike Place. When Jason came at you, you had to come from I love that guy. He's great. I'm sorry for getting defensive. It may look like group therapy, but this is their official bi-weekly staff meeting. They have to come committed to each other, you know, making sure that we support each other and that we can do the best we can. So the family environment. Team environment. Team environment. 545! Put the fish to bed, another 12 hour day in the can, call it good. See you tomorrow morning. See you tomorrow. So as the guys here will tell you, success is possible in whatever field you are in. The key, as simple and hard as it may sound, is to believe in yourself and your brand. Set your goals high and don't be afraid to achieve them. And remember that it takes people to buy your product, to spread word about your business, and to make it all really happen. So be truly great to them and they'll throw it right back to you. Pike Place Fish Market, another cool running company. Stay tuned for more business innovation here on Business on Main. Okay, what are your thoughts on that? Looks like a fun place to work. Mm -hmm. It does, doesn't it? It's a fish market, but it looks fun. It's good we haven't got smell o vision because we probably <laughs> <laughs> might change our mind if we could smell it, but. Uh, Having said that, what did you notice in terms of what did they learn? Any ideas? Anything in mind? Having a vision. They had yes. Long term goal. Yeah, they had it. They certainly they started off with a vision, didn't they? They had their brainstorming going on. Uh, and what was interesting is even the owner of the company, when someone said, let's be world famous, he said, are you crazy? We're just a fish market. But they went for it. You know, it sounded like a ridiculous idea, but then they got the commitment, didn't they? That was quite important. Commitment to the vision and, and to each other, to support each other in making it come alive. Good. What else? What else did you notice from the video? Learned it was all about their customers. Yeah. What about their customers? Experience that they have on the way. Giving the customers an experience. Fun experience. Yeah. Making them happy. Yes. Making them happy. And what what did they respond when the journalist asked, "How do you?" Was it how do you yeah. give them that customer experience? No, no. They said smile. They said they leave with a smile. Yeah, that was how do we measure success, right? Yeah. When he asked the owner, and the first thing was. Profit. Profit, yes. And the second one was the number of customers that walk away with a smile on their face. <coughs> that was the second measure. It's quite high on the list of priorities, which was good. And it obviously showed because uh, how much growth have they had? 400% between 86 and now, I think it is, isn't it? But rapid growth every year. 
Um, what else was there? What else were they doing to demonstrate learning and how they continue learning? They kept a strong relationship with each other yes. um, by having holding them dinner meetings and so on. That's right. Yeah. Um, Expressing each other's feelings. So. Yes, yeah, so, just yeah. having a, two, a meeting every two weeks, wasn't it? Mm. Yes, and uh, just talking over issues that had happened and having that, that transparency there um, where they get to discuss what's going on and the owner was helping them to figure out the right attitude to have towards each other when, when things aren't going so well. Because it, it was nice to see that example because even though they're obviously very successful, there are still sometimes little issues that are going on that need to be worked on. So I think that was, that was quite useful to be aware of. What else? What else did you notice? What, was, uh, what I thought was interesting was that <coughs> the, the customers obviously were having a great experience there. And there was a lot of emphasis on building that relationship with the customer. Now, what would happen if they go to the same person, usually the customer, and if that person's not there, what's going to happen? That relationship could be gone, except everyone else in the team is giving the customers the same relationship, aren't they? Everyone is on board. So even if the person they usually go to isn't there, you can tell, you could approach any, anybody else that works there, you're still going to get a great experience. Might not be exactly the same, but you know you're still going to get a good experience. So I think that was quite um, informative, that everyone is supporting that, that model that they have, that the customer comes first, the customer's experience is important. How are they treating the customers? As a customer? As, as, human beings. as fellow human beings. Yeah, and each other as well. Um, and they weren't shy about saying, we, we want to love our customer, we want to show our customer that we love them. They weren't embarrassed about it. Why not? And it obviously had a profound effect on their business. But not just their customer, each other as well. Yes. So, um, was that a useful video? Interesting, yes. I think there's a lot to learn from that video. Um, it's used a lot in training of poor businesses because of the difference that it makes. And I, I've been to Seattle and I wish I went to the fish market. I forgot about it completely, but it would have been nice to go and visit to say, see if they live up to this experience. Um, so if anyone goes to Seattle, if anyone's planning a trip out there, let me know how it goes. Go and pay them a visit. <laughs> Let me know how, how it goes. So, good. It just goes to show that, you know, even for a successful business, I mean, worldwide business, they're still learning constantly and making differences and changes. Learning is something that takes us out of the comfort zone. Do you know what a comfort zone is? Yes? Comfort zone is that area in life where we can sometimes get to where everything is just the way it should be. Everything is stable and safe. Yes? You eat the same foods, you go out with the same people, you wear the same clothes, you go to the same places, you do the same things. I wonder what that was. <coughs> you, do <laughs> you do the same things, yes, and everything is all, all happening the same way. Which is nice. It's cosy. It's comfortable. The only problem with that is that quite often the things that we, we want that we haven't yet got require us to go out of the comfort zone. Yes, it requires us to make a change. We're not going to achieve it by staying in the comfort zone, otherwise we'd have it already. I mean, how many times have you, I don't know, made a New Year's resolution or joined the gym or said, I'm eating five pieces of fruit every day, or whatever it is, yes? You made that initial commitment, and you're highly motivated. Right, that's it, I've joined the gym, I'm going every day. And you get out of your comfort zone, and you go, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm going every day, you tell your friends, you've only been three days, but you tell them, I'm going every day, yes? And you do for a couple of weeks, and then Monday, oh, I had a late meeting, so I didn't go. Tuesday, I've got a bit of a headache. 
Wednesday I'm going out with friends and all of a sudden these excuses come up and the next thing you know, you're back in the comfort zone. Yes, have you ever experienced that? Yeah, we've all been there, right? And you're still paying for the gym <laughs> six months later, but you're still in the comfort zone. Why? Because the comfort zone is a bit like a magnet. It kind of draws us back. It's our habitual way of being. And so in order to do something different, we require a lot of energy to maintain that difference. But once that becomes a habit, that can be a new comfort zone. Now, learning is something that takes us out of the comfort zone. Because we're a, we have to change as we acquire new knowledge and experiences. So I'm not a huge fan of comfort zones. But quite often, a lot of people find themselves in there for years. So if that's the comfort zone, and that's the thing that we want to achieve, sometimes people will step out of the comfort zone, and they will quite often end up going back in. A little bit like my husband. When I met him, he'd been in the same company since university. And he'd been there for about five or six years when I met him. And, that, and he's like, you know, this is what I want in life. He had ambition. I didn't have any ambition, so I was quite, you know, surprised to meet someone with ambition. And he had an idea of this is the kind of life that I want. And I was like, wow, that's great. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to get it? He said, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Just work really hard, get my head down, keep doing what I'm doing. I said, okay, well, that's good. I'll cut a long story short, but after 18 years of service, doing the same thing, he got made redundant. And his performance dropped, that's the down arrow, yes, where your performance dropped. Because he was pushed out of his comfort zone. Sometimes that happens, yes, you have an external factor that pushes you out of your comfort zone. He had a drop in performance. How do you think he was feeling when he was made redundant? Scared. What else? Down. Worried. Huh? Depressed. Depressed. Oh God, he does depression really well. Yeah. Anxious. Lost. Worried. Worried. Absolutely. And he was. And it, you know, it's normal to feel that way initially when something like that happens. And we were at home, and he would put on garden leave. He works on IT, so he was put on garden leave. And he was messing up my house for three days, and um, he was really worried. And we were getting ready for bed. And he says, Sheila, what are we going to do? I'm really worried. I'm nearly 40. Who's going to employ me? Loads of people in IT are getting made redundant. This is when the credit crunch hit. 2007, 2008? What am I going to do? How are we going to pay the bills? How are we going to pay the mortgage? What are we going to do? Where am I going to get another job? And I said to him, you're really worried, aren't you? He said, yeah, I'm really worried. And I said, well, if worrying helps, carry on. And he went, what? And I said, if it helps, then carry on, because you've become an expert. You're really good at worrying. And if it's not helping, maybe do something else instead. I rolled over and went to sleep. I had a great night's sleep. I'm not sure about my husband, but the funny thing is, when he woke up the next morning, he said, you know what? There were things that I could have done to make myself more valuable, because I'm in the same position for the last 10 years, and there were opportunities presented to me that I should have taken, that would have given me a better place in the company, and I, then I wouldn't have been made redundant. You know, that there was so much more that I could have done that I didn't do. And actually, maybe this is just the kick up the backside that I needed to focus on where I actually wanted to be in life, because I lost my focus. The interesting thing was that after that realisation, you know, he built himself back up and uh, got his CV out there. Now, within five weeks, he got a contracting job on double the salary he was made redundant from. Yes. So the thing is, he didn't dwell on it too long. I gave him three days, then I thought I'd have enough of this. <laughs> but after that, you know, he picked himself back up, got himself another job, and he's been employed ever since, which is great. Problem is, he's in another comfort zone. <laughs> but this is quite often a cycle that people go through. And the comfort zone we can be in sometimes for years without realising it. Now, as well as being pushed, sometimes people experience pain 
to get out of the comfort zone. And what I mean by that is sometimes, you know if you've got that inner feeling that I've had enough of this, I'm not doing this anymore, I've had enough. Yes, and then you, you move yourself out of the comfort zone. So quite often those things will, will get us out of the comfort zone. The thing is there is actually a third option. And this is a paradox. The third option is to be comfortable being constantly out of the comfort zone. So taking ourselves constantly out of the comfort zone. And for that, something quite major is required. First of all, internal self-discipline and motivation. But also how to keep that going. Because sometimes you can get that, can't you? That initial motivation and discipline. But how to make it last. The way to make it last is to make sure we've got a very clear idea of where we're heading, the goals, targets, things like this, KPIs. If we focus on those on a regular basis, they're the things that keep the motivation and the energy going to stay out of the comfort zone. And really, if you think about it, any goals and targets and KPIs that you have, if you look through them, quite a few of them require us to get out of the comfort zone. Do you, does that make sense? It's, they can't be achieved if we stay where we are with our current knowledge, with our current experience. We have to know more. We have to do more in order to achieve some of those targets and KPIs. So I'm not a huge fan of comfort zones for that reason. Um, because the only way to, to get better at what we're doing is to constantly stay out of the comfort zone and not need this push or this pain in order to do it. And I think certainly in the company, I've only been here five months now, but in BNS group, there's no room for comfort zones, are there? No? No, I'm pretty sure there's no room for comfort zones. Welcome. <laughs> no room for comfort zones in the BNS group. And this is the reason why. Because to remain static, especially for a business, to remain static, you're actually losing 10% year on year if we don't if we don't make some adjustments and move with the times. If to to just maintain where we were, where we're at, we have to grow by at least 10%. So anything above that 10% is actual growth. Um, so it's has, has, can anyone identify with this? Sometimes feeling being pushed or feeling so much pain that you can take yourself out of the comfort zone. Yeah. You probably all experience that at some point. And what about this? Taking yourself out of the comfort zone. Yeah? We do that. It's useful to be aware of so that we don't get stuck relying on this one. And we can be more self-aware and be in charge of ourselves, taking ourselves out of the comfort zone. And learning is one of the things that allows us to do that comfortably and with self-motivation. Learning to learn is important for the business and it's important for us within the business. It's important in the business because it allows us competitive advantage. How do you think it allows us to improve our competitive advantage? Don't make the same mistakes twice and continue improving. How does that help in terms of competitive advantage? You're always going to be able to compete because you've got more experience from your regular time you've done. Yeah, so to, to improve efficiencies, bring our costs down. So cost-wise, we could win a more competitive place compared to our competitors. How many times can you say the word competitive in a sentence? <laughs> yeah, so a competitive advantage helps the business. In terms of long-term financial success, the more profitable we are, the more stable we are in the long term. We can reinvest that money back into the business, grow the business, and keep that money coming back in, coming back in reinvesting in facilities, in uh, equipment, improving efficiencies, etc. And of course, it increases customer satisfaction. A happy customer is one that keeps coming back. So we can keep those customers, and hopefully, they'll also um, build our customer base by reputation. They'll recommend us to 
to other customers as well. It's also for good, good for us as individuals in the company, it's good for our career progression, because the more we know, the more valuable we are to the company. It means we might be able to move to different departments or within the area that we're in and grow in terms of the level that we're at, if we choose to do that, if that's something that we want to do. Therefore, our benefits are going to improve. And job satisfaction, because the more independence, autonomy and variety that you have in the work that you do, you feel more satisfied, right? You get bored if it's just repetitive and you have to keep going to someone for authorization, whereas when you get to do things off your own back, it feels better, you get more satisfaction. So it's good for the business and it's good for us as employees in the business. Learning to learn is all about acquiring new skills. Every day. Every day. What about a different site? Every day. Every day. <laughs> what about a different country? Every day. <laughs> different to learning to be better, acquiring new skills, acquiring new knowledge and new behavior. <coughs> this is where we learn something brand new. Learning to be better comes when we build on that. Learning to learn is about what we don't already know. It's acquiring new knowledge. Now, I've got another video. It's 11 minutes. Has anyone read Who Moved My Cheese? Any chance? Yes, you've read it? Good. Uh, have you seen the video? Okay, get to see the video. Long yeah? time. Long time back, yes. It's, a, it's a, a book that's used a lot. Have you? I think so, it's quite old. Yeah, quite old. I think it's about eight, ten years old. Yeah. Something like that. It's a good book. Joining in. So, again, as you're watching the video, take some notes. Um, because we are, I want to discuss the different characters in the video. Once it's finished. Okay. Station C and discovered there was no cheese. They weren't 
surprise, since they noticed the supply of cheese had been getting smaller. The mice did not overanalyze things. The situation had changed, so sniff and scurry changed. They were soon off in search of new cheese. Later that day, Ham and Hall arrived at Cheese Station C. They have not been paying attention to the changes that have been taking place. Much, but enough to keep him going. 
I've got to get back and, and tell him there's some new cheese out here. Pa raced back to Cheese Station C, following the route he had marked. He found his friend still hemming and hawing. Ham had not even put on his running shoes. Oh, Ham, uh, you look hungry. Uh, here, have a few bits of new cheese. I don't think I would like new cheese. I want my own cheese back. I'm sure if I wait here long enough, things will be the way they were. Will Ham ever change? Ham was left behind. Ham did by fear, comfort, and denial. I guess Ham believes he can't, or, or won't, enjoy new cheese. He seems to believe that if he ventures into the maze, things will get worse. I see now that if I do things differently, things will get better. When you change what you believe, you change what you do. Hall found bits of cheese here and there and began to regain his strength. He had hoped that Ham might find his way by reading the handwriting on the wall. Paul had let go of the past and was adapting to the present. He was pursuing new cheese. And then, it happened. Mile high everywhere was the greatest supply of cheese he had ever seen. Wow! New cheese! Is it real or just my imagination? It is real! Pa realized that Sniff and Scurry had been enjoying new cheese for quite a while. He vowed that next time, he would change faster. Pa knew it would be easy for him to slip back to his old ways if he got too comfortable. So each day, he inspected Cheese Station N to check the condition of his cheese. He went out into the maze and explored new areas. He knew it was safer to be aware of his real choices than to isolate himself in his comfort zone. Then one day, Haw heard what he thought was the sound of movement out in the maze. Could it be him? Was him about to turn the corner? Haw hoped that maybe, at last, his friend was finally able to... Move to the new cheese and enjoy it! Can you read the handwriting on the wall? Change happens. They keep moving the cheese. Anticipate change. Smell the cheese off it so you know when it's getting old. Adapt to change quickly. The quicker you let go of old cheese, the sooner you can enjoy new cheese. Enjoy change. Savor the adventure and enjoy the taste of new cheese. Be ready to change quickly and enjoy it again. They keep moving the cheese. two groups and what I want you to write down in your two groups is what you noticed about Sniff and Scurry, what you noticed about Hem and what you noticed about Hall. Alright, so one group can use this flip chart and the other group <coughs> can use the flip chart at the back. Okay, and you've got ten minutes. CDs in the room. <laughs> All right, so let's have a look at this then. What have you got for Sniff and Scurry? If you want to just... Yeah, they were ready to change. So if I, uh, it was not like they waited for the things to go wrong and then they started off. But then it was there in their head that, you know, something is going to change, be ready for it. Yeah. So that's how we turned out. Yeah. And they were quick to respond. They never kind of bothered on, you know, as to know basically where the move cheese is or mm -hmm. why it moved. They were ready for it and they kind of responded, you know, basically. That was the situation at that, that point in time they went for it. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I guess there was some bit of teamwork. Yeah. They had then. the shoes around their neck ready because they knew one day they were going to have to They were ready for it. Anticipation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And they were proactive. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, what about him? I guess it was slow towards the change. Mm. 
but he had he was willing to change mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. Though you know, kind of at least after the day, Jesus moved, he knew that there was no other option but to change and see basically how to kind of uh, deal with it. Uh, so, but willing to change and. Uh, he learned to be ready to accept change. Then when he moves around to finding out the cheese in the maze, I and mean, he comes up with all his experience saying that, yes, this is going to happen, this is bound to happen, it's better be ready for it. Mm -hmm. So it means that he's accepted that change. And then he was moderately active. We actually took that proactive on the first case, so we thought, you know, that was kind of moderately active the second one. Okay. Do you feel he was moderately active, or do you think it was more more distinct than that? He wasn't it was certain case, because in most cases he was listening to what I had to say the majority of the time, and so that's, that was blocking him off. Yeah. And then after that, he started <coughs> yeah, motivating he, himself to. He was forward. actually quite, quite proactive, good. but he got drawn in by the other one, quite didn't quite he, at the beginning? The mood oh, yes. hoover. Oh, yes. <laughs> mm. Drew him in a little bit. Yeah. 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 And then he thought, no, I need to be more. So they didn't have a teamwork. Yeah, they did. you're right. These guys definitely had teamwork. Do you know what their strategy was? One was sniff and one was run. One was to run into walls and the other one was Absolutely. Sniff. Yeah, absolutely. Well spotted. They played to their strengths. One was good at the research, the other one was good at the go-getting. Get, go Isn't it? A little bit like you two, really. <laughs> yes, the, the, you know, I'll, I'll go and hunt it down, you go and get it. If that doesn't work, I'll hunt another one down and you go and get it. But they played to their strengths, acted as a team. Okay, let's look at Boar, the bald one. Mm. What did you guys notice? Explain. He was never ready to change. Mm, in fact, he was kind of running all day. I mean, that's what we think that point. Yeah. He was always running in the past, thinking why the Jesus moved, because he never expected that happening. Mm. Uh, I guess he was very happy in his comfort zone. Yeah, sure. he was happy being unhappy in his comfort zone. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, sometimes you meet people who are just, they're not happy in the <coughs> You know? He was a bit like that, wasn't he? Yeah. Good. Dwelling in the past. In the past uh, not ready to take any advice because mm. this guy kept on telling him let's move up and see if we can find some teeth. But he was not ready to do that. Mm -hmm. So he was not ready to take any advice on that. And inactive, more or less in that kind of thing. He was just paralyzed, wasn't he, really? In his own what was he thinking? Why? Who moved my cheese? Why? Why me? How dare they, whoever they are? Yes, I want my old cheese back. I don't want new cheese, I want my old cheese back. It was all over analysis, wasn't it? That was paralysing him where he was. Okay, good. Right. Let's see what you guys have adopt. Go for it. Sniff and scurry. Team effort, come on. <laughs> 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 yeah, same as them, they were willing to change, so they went out straight away. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's not afraid, so they were in a maze, so they went around the inside. So, uh, they kept it simple, didn't yeah. they? Mm -hmm. Just didn't kept it simple. <coughs> no analysis, this is what we need to do, let's just get on and do it. Pretty much. Yeah, same, they worked together, one sniff, one went one after it. Mm -hmm. They had a clear goal in their minds and they just went for it. Yeah. They were constantly outside of their comfort zone. Yeah. And, and they were, it was not new to them, it wasn't painful experience. They didn't analyse why they should do it, they just... They were not ready to Yeah. It, for them that was the instinct. So that was their natural, habitual way of behaving. Good, let's look at him. We've got lots there for him. He took this, he was really good to get on. Mistakes. And uh, he was willing to go out of his comfort zone and he found the new and better cheese. <laughs> what was really clever about him was not only did he learn from his own mistakes, he learned from Paul's mistakes, but he learned from these guys as well. You know, he learned, as well as learning what not to do, he learned what to do, which is, you know, it's kind of what learning is about. It's it's a balance of the two. It's an advantage. Yeah. Good. Let's look at Paul, the bald one. He was a mood hoover. 
Yeah, he was, wasn't he? Quite depressing. Yeah. He was angry, he was lazy, mm -hmm. hungry. Oh, yeah. Angry. <laughs> <laughs> yep, he was all those things. Didn't want to work for nothing for. He just wanted his old way back. He didn't want to work to get nothing yeah. new, experience something new. Yeah. He felt he had a right to the cheese and they should put it back wherever they were. Just, just uh, focusing on criticism, blaming, over analysis. Just wasn't happy to change at all. Wasn't happy to listen to the colleague who was prepared to give him some help and guidance. Not happy at all. Good. Some, uh, some quite a lot of information in that. It's only 11 minute video. But actually there's a, there's a lot in there. And you know what, we're all human. I'm sure we can all identify ourselves with each and every one of those characters at some point, even the bold one. Yes, um, but the good thing is that once you, you're aware of it, you can do something about it. You know, and, and it, sometimes you might be a little bit like this, bit uh, on the effect side for two or three minutes, and then you kind of think, right, let's get on with it. You have a strategy for getting out of it. Um, but I like the video, I think it really hits home a lot of points and, um, and we've got most of them down pretty much. Let's just have a look. I think what's quite useful to remember is that Hem, when he started to get the switch in his head, he started to ask himself, what if in a positive way. Initially it was negative because he was following Gore's example. Oh, all the fear, what if there's no cheese, what if it's dangerous out there? And then he changed it to more positive. What if there is no cheese out there? And what if I did get out there? So he changed the quality of his internal self-talk. And that had, that's what caused that switch, isn't it? Good. Well done. Right. When it comes to learning to learn, how can we learn from all of these? Yes, and probably more. Let's look at learning from each other. When you were just going through this, did you pick up things from your colleagues because they noticed something that you didn't? Yeah. So we can learn from each other. Our customers, can we learn from our customers? Yeah. How do we do that? Speaking to them. Speaking to them, exactly. All these things have to be put into action, don't they? Actual things. <coughs> you have to glean that information from them, get the right answer. But sometimes just in general conversations. If we don't have that contact with our customers, we're not going to know what's going on. And our customers are not just the pharmacists or the hospitals or whoever. They're customers within the organisation, right? Yeah. What about our competitors? Can we learn from them? Yeah. Yeah. How do we learn from them? Past experiences. Yeah. yeah. Through our customers. Through our customers, absolutely. They're the ones who've got a lot of information, our customers. Between them, they can give us a lot of information what our competitors are doing. What works and what doesn't work. It's all good feedback for us, isn't it? Yeah. Good. From the internet? Research. Yeah, there's not a lot you can't research on the internet. And, but sharing that knowledge as well. Courses? Can learn from courses? Yes. It tends to be more technical, academic stuff on courses. But learning isn't just about that. You know, sometimes learning is as subtle as there's an adjustment that needs to be made because a customer wants it this way. <coughs> okay, it's different to how we look, sorry? Sorry, no, okay. It's different to how we normally do it, but they want an adjustment, but we, learn, we have to learn how to do it differently for them. It's still a learning. It's, learnings aren't always academic. From our experiences? from our own and others' mistakes? Definitely. Definitely. Yes. We need to learn that. We, the only way we can do it is by talking to each other. Yeah. Um, that's the best way of learning, is communicating with each other. 
So that's why there's such an emphasis now on ensuring that there are one-to-ones happening with managers and individuals, there are team meetings that are going on to share information and knowledge. Not just on site, but if you think about it, we've got teams over in Ryslip, we've got teams at Waymade, we've got teams in India as well, that a lot of what we do impacts on other departments. So, how many times a week do you have to interact with a different department? Every day. Every day. What about a different site? Every day. Every day. <laughs> what about a different country? Every day. There you go. <laughs> and we need to, right? Because if you didn't, if you didn't interact every day, what can happen in 24 hours? Well, 48 hours. Quite a lot. Yeah. Especially the pace that we move at. You know, a lot can happen in 48 hours. So it's really important that we keep those lines of communication. Hethel suggested SWOT analysis, learning through SWOT analysis. Mm -hmm. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You know, and this can be done for individuals, can be done for teams, for whole departments. We can base it on a specific customer, we can base it on a, on a whole industry, geographical area, whatever. In so many different ways. Um, and this is why internal networking is so important because what we do doesn't just impact our own area. It's gonna, there's bound to be an impact in so many other areas. So the more people that we know around the business, the easier it is to access information and to get things done. They need to be done. Good. We're going to move on to learn to be better, but just before we do, quick five minute comfort break. Yes? Okay. Literally five minutes. If you go and check your emails and get stuck, I'm going to start with that. Five minutes, okay? Let's start. Learning to be better. Why? Why do you think that's important? Improve. Upwards, forward. Forwards, upwards. <coughs> yes. Can reduce new trends, new things that are coming up. Yes. Being able to adapt to whatever comes at you. Yes. Cheap your calls. Yeah. Progression. 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 Yeah. So it's all there's a reason for it, and it's all good. Yes. So learning to be better is important for a number of reasons, including the ones you've just said. One of them is because failures happen, mistakes happen, and that, that's just a signal something needs to be improved, something needs to be changed or adapted or whatever it might be. So by knowing that they're occurring and having an attitude of, okay, how can I make this better? rather than blaming or criticising or trying to hide it, being embarrassed about it. Okay, this is what happened. Need to improve it, need to make it better. Having that sort of attitude to improve things. Um, there's a book called Failure Breeds Success by Mike Green. Mike Green is our new, one of our new non-executive directors. Um, he's doing a lot of work with the board and with various individuals in the company. And he's written the book, Failure Breed Success. So I've got some copies, they've been lent out at the moment. If you want to borrow a copy, let me know. I've also got other books at the back, sorry, I forgot to mention earlier, um, which you're more than welcome to borrow. A few people have taken some today already, so if you want to borrow any, just let me know. Borrow them for a month if you need them, <coughs> that's fine, just let me know. Some of them are quite quick and easy to read. You've got one, Jess, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Which one was it? I can't remember which one it was now. Emotional intelligence. Oh, yeah. Yeah, read them and let me know because I haven't read them all. So. Sorry? It's a good one. It's a good one, yeah. Let, you know, give me some feedback on them as well. Um, uh, failures and mistakes happen. Um, they affect us, that our colleagues, other departments. <coughs> other sites, etc. So we need to get things sorted quickly, and especially here because of the, the rate of change that we experience in BNS. When things happen, we need to get them sorted out very, very quickly. 
And I think if anything, I've noticed over the last, last five months, that's actually a huge strength in the company. I don't think maybe even you guys realise what a strength that is, to be able to make those adjustments quickly at a moment's notice. It's hard, yes? There are some times when you think, oh, really now? But my God, do you guys get results? Do you guys get things sorted? And, and it's every department I've noticed. You're, you're really quite amazing in your ability to make changes very, very quickly and get results out there done very, very quickly. I, I think it's a huge strength. Um, quite often changes happen that are not in our control. They're imposed on us, usually from Summit <laughs> or the directors or from other industry, regulatory changes, competitors. <coughs> but we still have to make those adjustments. So the, the ability to constantly be better and improve means that we can, we can adapt to those changes. And also recognizing that every experience is a learning experience. It's not all about learning something technical or clinical. It could be a soft skill, learning how to do things what kind of things can block learning? Miscommunication? Yeah? Is Mental. that what you said? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mental state. Mental state, what, have, having the wrong or attitude? Being, being like or, yes? To stay in your comfort zone. Yes, wanting to stay in the comfort zone. Yes. Lack of communication. Lack of communication, yeah. Not enough communication. Resources. Lack of resources, yeah. Absolutely. Sometimes you just got to make do with what you've got. Yeah. There's lots of things that can, can block learning. But one of the biggest ones, I think, one of the ones that certainly Hall is suffering from, is attitude. Attitude to himself, but also our attitude to others can block learning, especially if we base our attitudes on past experiences. Because what we don't allow is, for example, if it was myself and I had an attitude that I can't learn anything new, that I'm terrible at learning new things, that's going to hold me back because my brain already has the ability. In fact, our, all of our brains love to learn. They're constantly learning. So it's not that I, I can't do it, it's that I've made a choice not to without realising it by having that perception of myself based on past experiences. Yes. But also, if I have that attitude towards someone else that they can't change, that they can't learn this, that they can't do the other, that's going to block their ability because I'm going to impose that perception on them. Does that make sense? So it's really useful whenever we, we're meeting someone to just experience them at that moment in time rather than basing our judgments on past experiences. Because if you think about when you first started in the organisation, how much you've learned since you first started. And then think about, okay, in a year's time, how much more you will have learned <coughs> from now to then. And then allow yourself to do that for someone else. If you think about where they've started and where they are now, and what the possibilities <coughs> are for them. So sometimes we need to take away those internal barriers, those attitudes that we might have. Because the thing is, we can't notice anything. We can't see anything outside of what we already believe to be true, either about ourselves or others. So sometimes we need to change those beliefs. What we see in others is often a reflection of our own beliefs and expectations about them, not necessarily what they're capable of. Does that make sense? So to, in order to help them to learn to change and do things better, it's always useful to be open-minded. We're doing um, a lot of training with the room leaders over at Ricelip. Because you know, a lot of them are room leaders and they've, never, they've got no leadership skills and they're having to do this very responsible position and hit targets at the same time. 
And now, with some of the training that's gone in there, you can see there's been a huge improvement. There's still some more work that needs to be done, but it's not that they don't have the ability or the, or the capability, maybe they just didn't know how. But with the right information, they've been able to make really good changes for themselves. You can only notice in others what you decide to notice. This is about sometimes, you know, it's very easy to pigeonhole somebody. Oh, this person is always like that. The problem with that is that we disregard any other information that doesn't fit the label that we've given them. Does that make sense? So rather than do that, let's just get rid of all the, the labels and the pigeonholes and let's just treat them as an individual at that moment in time. Give them a fresh start, if you like. Because whether you believe you can or cannot, you're usually right. Has anyone heard this quote? Who said it? Henry Ford, who made cars about 100 odd years ago. Yeah, 101 now, isn't it? 1914, I think it's I'm not sure actually. Um, but I remember reading that uh, when I was about 20 something, and I thought, oh, that means if I can't do something, I can't do it. What he meant was change your belief. Because if you believe you can, you're more likely to be able to. Because lots of people have lots of abilities, but it's their beliefs that stop them. Do you remember the story of, what's his name? The man that ran the mile in one minute, the first one. Come on, some of the old ones you remember. I remember the four minute mile, Roger Bannister. That's the one, Roger Bannister. I'm going to say a mile in a minute is quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing, you see, back then, this is 1954, I think it was, 1954. And he was a neurologist. And he believed, and everyone in the medical profession knew for a fact that the human body couldn't run one mile in less than a minute. Because if they did, the lungs would collapse, the heart would burst, the eyes would pop out. I mean, they had all these theories on what would happen. Well, Roger Bannister was actually a neurologist, and he thought, you know what, I'm going to do it. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to do it. And he ran uh, a mile in, was it a mile? Four minutes. Or was it four minutes? That's it, four thank minutes, you. Yeah, One minutes. mile in less than four minutes. And he survived. Three minutes, 59 seconds. And they couldn't believe it. This was world news at the time. Now, what was interesting is that within a year of that, 15 other people around the world did it even faster. And they survived. So what changed? Human physiology? No, it was just the belief that changed. It was just the attitude that changed. So that was a great demonstration of how beliefs can hold people back. But when you change the belief, there's so much more that people can be capable of. That they just don't realize it. And the thing is, whether you believe others can or cannot, you're also usually right. So sometimes we have to be aware that we don't put limitations on others just because we have a perception about them. Does that make sense? Good. How can we learn to be better? There's lots of ways, but one of those ways is um, asking ourselves better quality questions. I think we visited this in, <coughs> in the first session. Yes. Sometimes when things go wrong, it's very tempting to say, why wasn't this done? Why did you do that? Why didn't you do that? Why have you done that again? Why are we still having these issues? Yes, have you, you've experienced that? And what happens? How do you feel hearing that, that sort of question? How does it feel? At the receiving end. You feel a little bit, oh my God, being told off. Yes, maybe you feel a little bit defensive or, or embarrassed. Yes. The thing is, the quality of the question can come over a little bit harsh. It's not meant to be, but sometimes it can just come over that way. 
Yeah, if we ask a better quality question, we're going to get much higher quality information back that's useful. We're not necessarily going to solve the problem, but it will be much more useful information coming back. So if we ask something like, okay, what can we learn from this? How can we improve the situation? We can work backwards. What's the result that we want to achieve? Okay, now how are we going to achieve that result? What you get is more ideas, more creative ideas, rather than focusing on the problem itself. Does that make sense? It provides ideas and solutions that will avoid the problem from occurring. It's, it's a much more proactive mode of questioning. It takes longer than asking why. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yes. But better quality questions, you're going to get better quality information back. For that reason, when we ask the questions, we have to listen and be open-minded. Because it's very easy to ask the questions and then think, I know what the answer is. But it might not be the only answer. Yes, sometimes people will come up with other suggestions that we've not thought of, and they're just as valid. You know, they'll provide just as good a solution. So it's important to be open-minded when we're asking these questions. Has anyone had a go at asking these questions yet from the first session? Yeah, had a little practice. It, it does take practice to do it, but it does work. So keep visiting them. They're especially good for things like appraisals and one-to-ones when you're coaching people. They're very useful. Okay. Now, perceptual awareness and learning. Sometimes, perhaps you've had an experience where you've worked with someone and you've had a negative experience with them. Yeah, maybe an argument or a disagreement. It doesn't have to be at work. Sometimes it can be with friends or family. Yeah? And then every time you see them, you just think about that thing <coughs> that happened two years ago. Yeah? Ever heard anything like that? And you think, oh, I wish I could just get rid of this feeling. but Because it, it's always kicking off at the back of your mind. Well, what we can do is we can use this. This is something that's a useful model for conflict resolution, for just getting rid of negative feelings from the past. But we can also use it to prepare for future events as well. And the way it works, if you're working on a past event, you've got yourself and the other person having a disagreement, yes? What you do is you imagine that I'm you're... I'm just saying, yeah, That one looks like you're serving. Yeah, well, mm, they're doing this. <laughs> they're just making a point. A I'm not up. quite sure, or they... Yeah, we're going to turn it into a thumbs up. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what else you mean. But anyway, let's move on. So what you do is you play the scenario in your mind, and you imagine that you're a third person, an objective observer, looking at yourself and the other person having a disagreement, yes? And then you ask yourself, what can I learn from this? <coughs> How can I improve the situation? What's the result that I want to achieve, and how could I have done that? Yes? Because what usually happens is you're only ever looking from your own perspective, but what this does is it makes you look at things outside of yourself, from a third person. And just notice what information comes to mind. Okay. Then you imagine you're a fly on the wall, up on the ceiling, looking down on the whole thing. And again, ask yourself, what can you learn from this? How can you improve it? What's the result that you want to achieve and how could you have achieved it? And then you put yourself in the eyes of the other person and run the same thing again. And what you notice is you get different ideas. You, know, you get different perspectives. You start to see things from the other person's perspective. And you think, oh, actually, I can see how what I said might have upset them. And maybe I could have said this instead. Maybe I could have done it this way or whatever. Yeah. And what it does is it allows us to get rid of the negative feeling from that event. And our brain automatically puts in a strategy for future events. So how to make things better in the future. Does that make sense? We can also use this when we're planning in the future. So for example, if you've got a meeting or an interview or a presentation, you put yourself in the eyes of the other person that you're presenting to or people, and 
and you ask yourself, what, what kind of questions are they going to ask me? What are they going to need to know? What do I need to prepare in advance for them? Yeah? You put yourself in the eyes of an objective observer watching the whole thing. And again, what, can I, what kind of things are going to be going on? How do I need to present myself? What do I need to prepare, etc.? And what it does is it allows you to start thinking about things outside of what you initially thought. Because quite often all we ever do is think from our own perspective but it forces us to think of things from a different perspective. Yeah. So useful for planning for future events as well. I use this with family, actually. <laughs> Works quite well. <laughs> right, words to use with care. <coughs> Some words, they're so tiny, but they have a powerful impact. Or not. Let's have a go at this. Don't think of a blue tree. Okay. Don't think of a blue tree. So what happens? Initially, for a moment, what happens? Think of a tree. You, you kind of have to, right? Why? Because your brain has to translate language into pictures, sounds, and feelings. It's just how the brain works. Language is secondary. right? So if you say, don't think of a blue tree, for a split second, your mind has to in order to not think of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, in fact, it's much better to, to, to suggest what to do rather than what not to do. It's just unfortunate that in the English language we tend to use don't and what not to do a lot more than, than what to do. It's a bit like when you're walking in the park and it says don't walk on the grass and everyone, they have to, <laughs> don't they? You've got to step on the grass, you have to. Or if it says wet paint, don't touch, you just, yeah, you have to. <laughs> it's just the temptation is there because they told you what not to do and you just kind of want to do it. It's just how the brain works. So much better to say what to do rather than not, what not to do. Sometimes you have to say to someone, don't do it this way. But it's always good to follow it up with, do it this way, so they know what to do. Um, let's look at the next one. Can't. What happens when you use the word can't? Your belief comes into it. Hmm? Your belief comes into it. Yeah. Can't. It's just a dead end, isn't it? Your body just goes, no, nope, can't. Your mind just shuts down. There's, there's no, it's like a dead end street. There's no moving on from can't. That's it. So what's the opposite of that? What do we really want to... Uh, can. Mm. can. Now, I appreciate that to jump from I can't to I can do something, sometimes it's just too big a leap. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense because we, we can't yet. What we can do is add, okay, I can't yet. Because what that does is it's like, oh, it's not just a dead end, it's a, oh. A glimmer of hope. Yeah, you're right, it's a, it is a glimmer of hope, isn't it? It's like, okay, this isn't a dead end after all. But what we can do is provide, a little stepping stone that goes from I can't to I can by asking ourselves a better quality question. How can I, whatever it might be. Because by doing that, you're just like, oh, the mind's going, hmm, well, how can I? And it starts to get creative. It starts to look for solutions to problems. It starts to get ideas generated. They might, the first one might not be the right one, but it will start thinking. The thing is, there's a bit in our brain called the reticular activating system. It's a bit like Google. And once you put a question in there, it has to find the answer. It's a bit like, you know, sometimes if you're trying to remember, I don't know, an author's name or an actor's name or something, you think, what's that person's name? And you can't remember, so you forget about it. And then 20 minutes later, it comes into your head, yes? Yeah. Sometimes in the middle of the night, it's really <laughs> annoying. What happened there? That's your reticular activating system. It's like a librarian. 
what it does, once it's got the question, it searches through your brain and it brings the information back. And it says, here it is. So in the same way, if we ask ourselves a high quality question, okay, how can I get that report done the way that Samit wants it? I don't know if any of you have ever had to do work for Samit. Yeah. <laughs> so I often find myself asking this question. Yes. How can I do it the way that Samit wants it? It's very particular. And you have to get creative. And the ideas start to come. And what that does is it's a nice stepping stone to, okay, I can do it. I've figured out a way. Or, I, all right, if I ask such and such, they might be able to help me. Or if I Google this, that then my information might be on there. It just gives you another avenue to go down. Yeah? And we don't just have to use it for ourselves. We can use it with our colleagues. How can you, and with our teams, how can we get X, Y, Z done? It just gets the ideas going. Yeah? Also, let's, let's look at the physical impact of I can't. Who can I borrow? Let me borrow you. Are you left or right-handed? Um, right-handed. Okay, great. Come stand over here. Right, we're going to do this exercise twice, all right? What I want you to do is to hold up your right arm like this, straight. Now, we're going to do this twice. The first time, I'm, what I want you to do is try and keep your arm up there, but I'm going to push it down. And I want you to say out <coughs> loud, four times, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Okay? Okay. All right, go ahead. I can't, I can't. Keep it up. I want you to try and keep it up okay. there. All right, go on. I can't, I can't. Uh, okay, I could push that down. I want you to hold it as a yeah, stop but I want you from you, pushing me down. Yeah, but I want you to say, I can't, I can't, I can't. Okay, okay. go on. I can't, I can't, I can't. Okay, all right, all right. I was pulling quite hard there, but okay, but you were maintaining focus. Okay. All right. This time, no. All right. Go back. Right, this time I want you to say out loud, I can, I can, I can, I can. Okay. All right? And keep your arm up there. Ready? Yeah. Okay, go. I can, I can, I can, I can. Okay, all right. Now, thank you. Did you notice the difference? Yeah. Yeah, because the first time I could have tipped you over, yeah, yeah, but the second time, that I just and I used more strength the second time than the first. Thing yeah. I could have swung off that arm. <laughs> yeah, could you feel the difference? Yeah. Could you notice the difference? Thank you. Did you notice the difference? Yes. Because literally, that little word "I can't" has a physiological impact on the body. It shuts down the nervous system. You must use this when you when you're lifting weights. If you think you can't, yeah, you just lose your the strength. energy's gone. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the body just shuts down. But when you say I can, the energy is there for some reason, and it stays there. It maintains this. So having that, the quality of that internal self-talk has a major impact on the energy available in your physical body. You'd be surprised at how powerful it is. More adrenaline. You, yeah, the adrenaline is there. But, but it's because the nervous system is listening. Remember, the words have to be translated into picture sounds and feelings. I can't, no feelings. Yeah. Yes, I can, well, there's energy there. Yeah. So just notice that. Notice the quality of your own internal self-talk, but notice the quality of other people's talk. Now, if you've got colleagues who are using a lot of I can't, they're probably stopping themselves without realising it. Let's look at but. How many times have you heard the word but in a sentence? And what does, what's the impact that it has? How does it feel? It depends what word comes before but. It's like an obstacle. Mm. Yeah? Like <laughs> I don't know, it's like when, you're, when you say something and you're like, but, it's, it's just like a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it feels like a no? Yeah. Defense man. You're thinking yes, feels... no, but you're leaning towards no side. Yeah, because it sounds like there's an excuse coming, there's a, there's a block coming, <coughs> a barrier. Sometimes the defenses go up, oh, it's a but. So you kind of switch off mentally sometimes when you, when you hear the word but. Yes, but you, you think, oh, 
I don't know. Whatever they said, all I know is there's a but there. Yeah, so quite often the listener switches off. I wonder what would happen if we replaced the word but with and. Let's have a go. Let, let's have a go. Um, think of an example. So let's say a customer says they've ordered after five o'clock and they want it in the morning, but it's not going to go till one o'clock, for example. I don't know if that's true or not, but let's just give that as an example. Um, so I want my order by one o'clock. Yes, but you've ordered after five, so there's no way that it's going to get there. How does it feel? No, but... Did you notice my tonality? For some reason, that word but kind of... It makes me feel quite negative. It makes you know? the tone of your voice or the way you... It kind of does, doesn't it? Tonality. The word but, you kind of drift off. There's not much energy in there. All right, same thing. Let's replace it with the word and. So, I'm the customer. I want my order by nine o'clock. Yes, and as you've ordered after five o'clock, we'll only be able to deliver after one. And what I'll do is tomorrow, I'll give you a call at four to make sure you get your order in before five so that you'll get your order in by nine o'clock the following morning. How's that? Did you notice the difference? Yeah. yeah. Because I didn't use the word but, I felt better my tonality stayed up, and I couldn't help but give a solution to a problem. Do, does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So it's one of those weird words, such a tiny word, but, and you can't avoid using it all the time. Just kind of make a little mental adjustment and just notice if, if there's a difference sometimes, especially where we're going to have an impact on someone like a customer. Would however have the same effect? I, you know what, it's debatable. I think, however, is just a subtle but. It kind of is. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Naughty boys in the room. Um, just have a go with and. You know what, it, it is different. It, it is, um, it does take you out of the comfort zone to change it to and. But the difference is quite profound. You, you'd be surprised that once you start using it, um, you have to do it consciously, you have to do it with volition. It takes a lot of practice to turn into habit. But there is a noticeable difference in the quality of the conversation when we do that. So have a go and let me know how it is. And another one is try. Now if on the emails I said to you, I'm going to try and be here at 2.30, would you have been convinced? No, why not? I'll, I'll try. What's wrong with that? There's a doubt. There's a doubt. No, I wasn't sure. Yeah, the, the thing with that word try, in certain contexts, for the listener, there's an element of doubt there. Yes, there's a lack of commitment. And the thing is, I could be very successful. I send emails to Alpha every day on, in the morning of what I'm going to do. And I could say, I'll try and do 20 things. Yes? And then in the evening, I can say, send another email saying, I tried to do 20 things, but none of them were completed. And the thing is, she couldn't have a go at me because I didn't promise anything. Does that make sense? It's very easy to try and do lots of things and not necessarily successfully complete them. And what it does for me is it puts a lot of tries in my head on my to-do list, but no serious commitment to actually achieving any of them. So much better to, let's say, commit to five and say, right, I'm definitely going to get those done. It's much more time effective to do that than to try to do something. There's no commitment in the word try. I appreciate that sometimes you need to use that word, fair enough. But just notice the quality of it. Notice the effect that it has on you, on your commitment to do something, and the effect that it has on the listener. Because it certainly puts an element of doubt in their mind that something's going to be done. Good. Right. Here are some examples using some of those words. Let's look at how we can change them. 
So instead of saying, don't forget that report, because what's that focusing on? It's focusing on forgetting, isn't it? Mm. So how can we change that? What can we say instead? Bring. Yeah, bring the report with you. Yeah. Or remember that report. And there's so many different ways of, of saying it, yes? Good. What about, I don't know? I'll find out. I'll find out, yeah. Or I don't know yet, mm. perhaps. Just putting that yet in place. I can't do this. I can do this. Yeah. I can't do this yet. Yeah. Or how can I do this? Yeah. Uh, we can't change this. I know you're dying to say yes. <laughs> I can read your mind. <laughs> what else can we say? Okay. Yeah, we can change this. Or how can we change this? Maybe we don't know how yet. We're asking ourselves, okay, how can we change this? Um, I know you can't do this, but I want you to try. How can we change that? Give it a go. Yeah. Give it a go. Good. What else? How else can we change it? I know you can't do this yet, but you would learn. Or I want to learn. Or exactly. Yeah. But you'll learn how to do it. The more you practice, the better you will get. I know you can't do this yet, but we haven't done the training yet. So once you've done it, you'll be a lot better. Uh, yes, but we need it done today. And? Go on, say the whole thing. Well, well just, yes, yes, and and yeah. yes, I appreciate the, the obstacles and we need it done today. So, how can we do that? You know, perhaps just add a little bit extra on to help develop a strategy or something. Try to be on time. Remember to be on time. Be on time. Or get there five minutes earlier. Oh, I'll meet you there five minutes beforehand. How's that? Or something like that. Yeah. Uh, or try and make it better. Make it better. Give it another go. Make it better. Give it another go. Yes. Have another practice, whatever it might be. There's loads of different ways of, of saying it. The thing is, it's about getting out of the comfort zone and noticing the impact of what we're saying. Is it going to have a negative effect or is it going to have a positive effect? Because if it has a positive effect, great. But if, it, if it's one of these that puts an element of doubt in the listener's mind, that's possibly going to have a negative effect. So how do we change that? Good. Useful? Good. Now, four steps to learning, believe it or not. There was a moment in time when we were all young, when we didn't know, we didn't know how to drive. We're going to use driving in the, as an example. Agreed? Yes? So this is what we call unconsciously incompetent. So we're not aware, unconsciously, incompetent, unable to drive. Yes? Incompetent at driving. Then we get a little bit older and we think, oh, I'd like to learn how to drive, but I don't know how yet. So we become consciously aware that we're incompetent at driving. We don't know how to drive. Yes? Then we start taking lessons, we take a test, we practice. It's, uh, we're learning how to drive, we're doing everything right. We're starting to learn, and this is what we call consciously competent. We have to pay attention to driving, and we're competent at it. Therefore, we pass our driving test. Yeah? Then we get a car, we practice. After a couple of months, we drive somewhere, and we don't even know how we got there. We've all experienced that, yes? How did we do that? Because we've become unconsciously competent. It's gone into our brain, 
how to drive, so we can do it without thinking about it, unconsciously, and we're good at driving, competent. Yes, we got there safely, did all the right things. The thing is, we have to be careful that we don't go full circle <coughs> and develop bad habits, cut corners, and become what we call unconsciously incompetent at the thing that we've learned to do. Does that make sense? Now in driving, it's quite obvious, driving too fast, not looking in the mirror, <coughs> running red lights, eating, texting, phoning at the same time, doing your makeup, whatever it is, at the same time as driving, yes? These are all the things that can unconsciously make us incompetent at driving. So it's quite easy to notice. But even in the work that we do, we need to know if we're becoming unconsciously incompetent. And the way around that is to keep revisiting consciously competent. This is what Sniff and Scurry were doing, weren't they? They were looking at the changes from the previous day. What was going on? Has the market changed? We can do that, we do that constantly. What's changed since last week? What's changed since last month? What's changed since this time last year? What are the predictions for the following months, for the following years? Yes. We need to be able to constantly do that to allow us to remain consciously competent and unconsciously competent. But not, we need to make sure we stay out of unconsciously incompetent. Because that's where bad habits form. Okay. Good. We all know how to learn from our mistakes, yes? I think we covered this in the first session. Asking better quality questions. And getting better quality <coughs> answers back. Good. Has anyone got any questions on what we've covered today? Anything they'd like to share? I've learned more about learning. You've learned more about learning? Is that a good thing? Always. <laughs> Good. Did you enjoy the videos? <coughs> yeah. They were quite good. Welcome to the boat. Yeah? Good question. See, the curiosity is there. That's a good thing. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get you guys to do feedback forms very quickly before you go as well. Right. <coughs> so there was the bird. The cage door was open, the window was open, and it was thinking, it's, it looks wonderful out there, I wonder what it's like to fly, I wonder where the other birds go, I wonder what it's like beyond those trees. But I have food and water here, where will I eat? Where will I find fresh water? And while it was contemplating its options, the owner came. 